almost about that time. Right about now. Right about now. Funk, funk, funk. Funk, so brother, brother, brother. Kristen Hanna, welcome back to the Right About Now podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. One of my favorite writers working today. I'm always thrilled to have you on the show. I was so excited that you had a new book. I will, true confession, I'm halfway through the book. I love the book, Ooh. big book. So please don't spoil the ending for me. <laughs> I won't. You can count on me. <laughs> okay. But let's talk about this. This was new territory for you. You know, the last book that I read by you, by that you wrote what took place during um, the Dust Bowl era. And now we've gone to Vietnam War era. I'm wondering what attracted you to that period of history? Um, well, you know, I was a child during the Vietnam War. And so it um, it cast a big shadow over uh, my early life, certainly. I was in elementary school and then later in middle school. And my friend's dads, you know, were serving over there. And one of my really good friend's dad was shot down and was missing. And so we wore those, you know, prisoner of war bracelets, which I talk about in the book. The idea being at the time that you would wear this silver bracelet that had the um, serviceman's name and, and the date um, that they became missing on there. And you would wear this until they came home. And so it was, you know, every single day for years, I was looking at my wrist and remembering this man who was lost and had not come home to his family. And so, you know, that made a big impression on me as a kid. And then I remembered later, of course, when when the vets started coming home and, you know, who wasn't coming home and how they were being treated and the the anger and the divisiveness, the political divide that was going on. It was just a very turbulent and chaotic time in America. And so I've been wanting to write about this era for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It just took me a long time to feel, you know, ready to tackle this subject that for years had been semi taboo in both film and, and book. And, um, and to be a good enough writer to do it justice and to find my way into a story that had such a huge canvas and and find a way in that I could tell a story that was mine and meaningful to me. So what sealed it for you? Was there a a moment? Was there a character you found? Was there a story you found that said like I'm gonna I'm gonna do this? Because when you make a decision to do a book, you you're all in and it's a big <laughs> decision. And yeah. You know, I'm sure there's many ideas you've had that haven't actually made it to the page. So what what sealed this one for you? Well, you know, um, I I started about about 15 years ago with the, the Nightingale. I really started focusing on women's lost historical stories. And so that became something that I've been really interested in for quite a while. And so I started thinking, OK, Vietnam, you know, the women's stories and, you know, I didn't know how many women were over there or what the woman's story would be, you know, so I was never quite sure. And then in March of 20, um, right after I had turned in the four winds, Seattle, where I live, you know, went on COVID lockdown and we were on lockdown for quite some time. And I live on a small island, so we were really shuddered for quite a while. And in watching the news, you know, you could see, of course, that how politically divided and divisive and angry the country was during all of this. And so I think that really reminded me of the Vietnam era. And then I was watching our medical personnel, our doctors and our nurses being, you know, worked uh, to exhaustion and, and carrying this very heavy burden um, for which, you know, I think a lot of us felt that they were not being um, respected for enough and, and helped enough, you know, and there wasn't enough support for them. And for some reason, that all coalesced in my mind into writing a story about the nurses of Vietnam and what they had faced, I think, because it all just felt very similar to me. And, um, and I had all this time on my hands to 
to do the, you know, Herculean research that was required. Yeah. Talk to me about that research. Was there a particular story you found about a nurse working in that time that really resonated with you? And, you know, I, apparently Frankie is based somewhat around a, a real person. Can you talk a little bit about that? Frankie is your main character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Frankie's my main character. She's not actually based on anyone, but there are there were a group of five or six or seven nurses whose stories um, really resonated with me. And so what Frankie really is, is more an amalgamation of several women's stories, you know, put through the the mill of my imagination and and what I had to say about them. But in reading their stories, the nurses, um, there were a lot of commonalities. You know, they were young. They tended to be from political, um, from families that really touted their previous World War II backgrounds and were very patriotic. And, and they had mostly very little nursing ex experience. And so they really went to Vietnam um, unprepared unprepared for the the nursing that would be required uh, for the life and for what it would be like at war. And, and then they came home to this very um, angry and, you know, divided America where people were protesting and, you know, so many things were changing so quickly. And they all seemed to have struggles upon re-entry. And so, um, so Frankie is really, I think, very representative of the women who went over there, but she is not, in fact, based on any one woman. Yeah. <clears throat> did you, how many interviews did you have to do just to sort of get a feeling of what it was like to be there, you know, to so you had a comfort level of being able to write about this era, um, having obviously not been alive during that time or gone to war in Vietnam. So did you, was it just extensive interviews? Is that how you kind of get in the... The characters a bit you know it's it's all forms you know there's interviews there's um you can go now of course on the internet you can find youtube yeah. videos and people talking about almost anything there are these amazing memoirs written by male and um female vietnam vets and so there was just there was a wealth of information um, and that's really what I used to write the book. But once I had written it, so I knew what the story was, I knew what the scenes were, I knew what I needed. That's when I felt like I really needed someone uh, to fact check me and to tell me, um, because I'm spinning all these different facts and narratives together into something that's totally going through my mind. And so I reached out to a woman named Diane Carlson Evans, who um, was a captain in the Army Nurse Corps and the founder of the Vietnam Women's Memorial. And she was the most amazing um, resource and inspiration and mentor. And she read several versions of the book and always gave me, um, you know, a very strong opinion on everything, which I loved. And she then, you know, introduced me to um, a helicopter pilot who read it and an OR nurse and a Red Cross nurse and a doctor. So I made sure that as many pieces of the book uh, were checked factually as I could. What were some things that you 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 got wrong? I'm curious, like, were there... Not to not to give your mistakes, but I'm just curious what uh what they might have flagged as like you know would never have happened, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things was um Diane said to me, you know, I had all the the women there in the the MASH type hospital and all of the camaraderie going on with the doctors and everything, and you know, the music of the era, which is so amazing. And Diane wanted to remind me that there were a lot of nurses who did not drink, who did not, you know, partake in that kind of stuff, that it wasn't just a given that there was drinking going on over there. So that was, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Right. Were there any, you know, you mentioned you watched a lot of YouTube videos. Did you watch, you know, I've, I guess I'm very schooled in Vietnam war movies. Um, like I, you know, I love apocalypse now. I love 
the deer hunter. I love, um, uh, uh, whatever the Stanley Kubrick platoon. one. Yeah. Oh. Platoon, the Stanley Kubrick one, um, uh, uh, full metal jacket. Oh. Um, did you, did you watch those movies? Cause I don't, how accurate are those movies even, you know, a lot of them are kind of like, you know, allegories some of them are not you know like you mentioned drug use and you know like apocalypse now is all a whole movie you're like watching you feel like you're high i saw that with my son recently in a theater and it was like whoa that's like so trippy that movie <laughs> um yeah. did you watch any of those i mean you probably had seen them before even before. oh i mean i'm you know um i've been a fan of those movies forever and i've you know i've watched them all as far as their accuracy i don't really know i mean i know that um, the battle that was portrayed, for example, in We Were Soldiers Once and Young, uh, the Mel Gibson movie, was very different and much more tragic than the way they portrayed it in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as sort of, you know, baseline accuracy, I was very clear that my story was about the nurses. And one of the reasons I did that was so that I could become, a, you know, kind of a semi-expert in a very narrow section, as opposed to try to, you know, understand everything about the war. Yeah. You know, the idea of a war hero is so different now than it was back at that time. And you even mentioned you had this idea 20 years ago, and I don't even know if 20 years ago, you know, what people thought of uh, the military, because when I was growing up, and I'm around your age, probably older. Um, but I also have a memory of the Vietnam War. And I have a memory of my father dressed in a uniform going to like basic training. He never served, but he went to basic training. And I remember, and I grew up in New York City. It was very liberal. I, I have all these home videos of my parents in these like hippie type parades. And so it was like, at that time, you know, I've seen hair, you know, and at that time, that kind of like liberal part of America was very anti- military, very anti-soldier, very anti-war. Um, and I almost wonder if a book like this, if you had written that book in 1973 or something, how well received it would be, uh, because, you know, it, a book celebrating in any way the, the the soldiers of that time were, you know, might have been frowned upon by like popular culture. Did you think about that at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was no question that the world, you know, wasn't ready for this book. 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and, and I think if anything, that's what I think the book points out. And I do believe that this is one of those instances that we as, as a country have learned from this mistake. I mean, I, I think that we understand very clearly that the war is one thing and the warriors are something else. And, you know, I think there is a great generalized sort of guilt from um the generation that that were so anti-soldier um and an anger in i'm hearing from young people angry that they were treated this way upon coming home you know in america and it's unthinkable so now right it's unthinkable for them to be treated badly now like if there's one thing that I feel like the left and the right sort of agree upon it's like respect for the military right. and for people who serve like that is that's yeah. changed. I don't know what changed that over time, how that changed, but it has. Um, but certainly was not the case when you when your book is coming out. You know, about the, the time that your book is uh, speaking about where, where soldiers were like spit on and things like that. Um, it's hard to even imagine that. I mean, it really is. And yet I heard over and over from the the vets I talked to. Yes, they remembered being you know, spit upon and yelled at and flipped off and all of this. And then one of my, the, the most interesting parts, I can't remember if this made it in the book or not, but after you did your, your tour of duty, um, you know, the soldiers would be flown home to like say Travis Air Force Base in Northern California. From there, you had to get home on your own. Mm. And I mean, the, so the military didn't even pay your way all the way home unbelievable yeah and look at the the psychological damage done to these men and they didn't even really yeah. understand what ptsd was right as like they do now and um what was in general the most challenging thing about writing this book for you and was it different than the, the other challenges you usually face with other books um 
you know, the, I, I think the the two biggest challenges, one is that, that this would be the first um, historical novel that I was writing where a really large part of my audience had either lived through it or, you know, had a relative who had lived through right. it. So there would be so many more people able to say, well, this is right, this is wrong, this is great, this isn't. Uh, so there was there was that challenge of, you know, writing a historical piece for people that lived through it. Mm. Um, and the other thing was in in researching this book and really sort of digging into what the nurses in particular, but it was true for the the male vets as well, what they lived through over there, what this war was like and the psychological damage that it did to them. And then as you point out, the exacerbating psychological impact of coming back to a country that not only didn't want to hear about your service, but actively disrespected you for having served. You know, you put all that together and, and I knew the difficulties these these vets had faced in coming home and and a lot of them thanks to agent orange or whatever are gone now and i felt a great pressure to to tell a story that they could embrace that they would feel good about and to um to shine a light on their forgotten service mm. How did you push through those moments of, you know, being concerned that you might not be getting this right or that people are going to say, oh, that's not how it happened or that's, you know, whatever the, your concerns were, because like you said, it's fresher in people's mind than say the Dust Bowl or right. the French resistance of World War II. Um, how did you push push through that? You know, that's just my job. I mean, yeah. you know, I, you I guess I'm glad I've been doing this as long as I've been doing it. And I have a pretty deep understanding of, you know, how to write a book and what a book is and a pretty clear idea of what it is I have to say. And I'm well aware that it is almost impossible to write any book and not make mistakes. There are just things out there that you don't even know to look for. And so you really, you know, you you do the very best that you can, you get as much help as you can. And then, you know, you sort of accept whatever yeah. uh, fallout or praise comes from it. Do you, does somebody like you, who's so accomplished, has written 20, you know, novels, over 20 novels, I think at this point, and uh, many of them bestsellers, most of them bestsellers, do you even have moments of self-doubt? I mean, I think <laughs> all writers have that voice in their head hello, me speaking, uh, of, of having, you know, like I, I'm terrible, like not the fraud. I, I know there's the fraud, uh, thing. I don't get that as much, but just like the idea that like, this is not good. <laughs> like as you're writing, <laughs> this is really not good. Do you still go through that? I mean, even, or do you, at this point, you kind of like, all right, I'm sort of the Michael Jordan of novel. Like, I know I'm pretty good at this, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, um, there is a requisite false or otherwise confidence that is required to do this because, you know, every book I finish, whether it's the four winds or the nightingale or now the women, you know, you look back and, and a, it becomes better in your mind than you actually thought it was when you were writing it, but you conversely think, well, that's as good as I'm ever going to be. And I wonder if I even have another book in me. Mm -hmm. And when you, you know, go and search for another idea, there's always this, you know, do I have this again? Does, does it still exist? And, and so I have to do what every writer has to do. I have to, you know, put my butt in the seat and just begin and just start writing and sort of understand that whatever magic exists, it does not unfortunately exist in my head. It exists only on the page. Mm -hmm. And so it is this constant sort of striving to, to get it down. And, and once I've gotten it down to try to be better, and once I've gotten it better, try to push myself farther, whatever it is, it's the 
it's the challenge I think of all writers and um, and there's always a huge component of fear you know with the four winds it like who wants to read about the dust bowl it was terrible <laughs> I did. Yeah, you know? a terrible then, time yeah so but you just don't know and then plus there was a big you know the other dust bowl book and we talked about this in your last you know was uh what it was not east of eden it was the other one the other steinbeck we well, so you're following oh, yeah grapes of wrath yeah right so you're following the grapes of wrath you know? <laughs> yeah yeah it's like <laughs> what am i doing right 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 <laughs> um but but anyway you always always managed to do such an amazing job um i don't know i think we talked a little bit about your process the first time we talked but i am curious because i know you really treat it as a job and you know you get your 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 butt in the seat and you write um do you write a certain amount of hours a day do you do you do it that way do you have a do you clock in clock out like tell me a little bit about your process of writing <laughs> Well, it, um, it has changed remarkably over the years. I mean, the great thing about writing is it's very fluid. And so as my life has changed, my process has changed, you know, in the, in the early days, I was a new mother and I was writing and I was a stay at home mom. And so the first like five books were probably written essentially during nap time. <laughs> um, you know, so I would work all week and 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 be ready to hit the ground run, running from 1.30 to, to 2.30 right. or whatever. And then as my son spent more time, you know, um, in school, my writing was school hours and school days. And again, with that kind of a schedule, I needed to do a lot of pre-work. You know, so there was a lot of outlining. There was a lot of biographical things. There was a lot of synopses so that I was very clear on the story I was telling. And when I had time, I sat down and I wrote the story I intended to write. Mm -hmm. And then as um, as I guess, I think me coming of age, getting older, hitting my 40s, my son um, being busy most of the time and having a lot more time to write, that's when I began to sort of break out and ask more of myself um, in terms of bigger stories, bigger canvases, deeper themes, um, you know, a lot of different things came in. And that's when my process became pretty unwieldy and unpleasant, actually, because I now don't necessarily write the book I intend to write. I do all the research. I figure out the beginning, the middle and of the, and the end. And then I actually write the story that is working. So I will generally throw away hundreds of pages mm. of things that I try that don't work out. Wow. And you had, it, it, that's not, you've gotten over the point where like, I can't throw these away. It's just, I think that's so, um, it's so brave to go in there and just know that you can be working on something for weeks and you're never going to use any of it. Right. It's, it's terrifying. And you're always, or at least I always am. I always think, you know, this is a good solid B. This is a mm -hmm. good B, B plus book. Um, and so I save it, you know, I don't like just ditch it. I, I pull out the pieces that's working. I throw away I save what's not working and then I completely start over and sort of incorporate whatever I'm, I'm doing um, to move in. For example, I think I told you in the four winds, the original draft, um, the primary character didn't even exist. I wrote an entire version of the book without her. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I did a bunch of changes with the women too. The only thing that was always there was her experiences during the war, right. but who she was before and who she was and what happened when she came home was always up for debate until, you know, I found it. And what I have found is while it's scary to throw it away, um, I have never made a book worse. I have failed sometimes to make it better, but I've never made it worse. And, um, and there's always something really crucial that comes from that uh, deep editorial process. Do you ever go back and read books after you've written them, or are they kind of do you kind of move on? Like that was a few yeah. years. Ago, you mean the ones that I published? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't read them again. They're done. 
It's, no, no, no. it's a different part of your life. Yeah. Right. Um, you mentioned in this earlier that you've learned things about writing novels over the years and 20, 20 novels in you've, and I'm curious what some of the big takeaways that you've learned over the years are. Um, uh, I have some thoughts about some of the things I've noticed that you do. One thing that really intrigued me is that you said that you had this kind of through line now that you've kind of discovered over the years, which is, you know, strong women, forgotten women of history. And that's a, a powerful, it's probably two different questions. Let me ask the first question first. Some of the things that you've learned um, over the years about novel writing, even just as far as structuring them, I'm just curious. Well, um, so I've learned that uh, conflict is crucial. And, you know, I'm an accomplished enough writer that I can sometimes write 100 pages with almost none of it. Mm -hmm. And that is a very bad thing. And that or that that is what ends up getting thrown away. So I I try to remember to the extent that I can that, you know, uh, conflict is what builds scenes and scenes are what build books. So um, so there's that. I have learned of the crucial importance of backstory um, to making the front story and and the conflict uh amp up and be driving uh and most importantly i would say i have learned to to the extent possible never allow fear to stop me from doing anything that i want to do mm. so important yeah so important for life but i think Fear and fear, and I think so often with writers, it's, it's fear of failure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, it's probably with most people, but I, I noticed when I did a survey once of my listenership, which is a lot of writers, and fear of failure was the, probably number one on the list of the reasons that they don't write or the things that stand in their way. And you know, it's it's really true, and it's something that has to be dealt with. I decided very early on. Uh, because of my fear of failure to actually embrace it and welcome it and seek it out. And I found that by like, not like seeking failure, like it's kind of my way of saying, I don't care what is selling. I don't care what you think will work. Um, I'm going to do what feels right to me. And I am prepared to fail because that feels like the right path to me and sort of embracing that um, expectation of failure was very freeing. Yeah. It, I think once, once, it, once you can get over that, then I feel like it, it, it really just opens the, the door for you to do so much more than you would normally do. Um, you have, and you, have, you have, I was just going to say very quickly, you also have to be careful because success can intensify the fear of failure. Mm. Uh, you know, you think as a beginning writer, like your fear of failure is probably so much bigger than anybody else's. But once you've done this and you know what you're doing and you like doing it, suddenly it's easy to become afraid of what readers think, of what reviewers think, of what your agent thinks. And allowing that fear in can then sometimes curtail what you choose to write because you actually try to write to be successful. And I think that can be a real success for failure. Yeah. Or a recipe for failure. Sorry. For failure. One thing that you do really well, and I noticed there, I was looking at your Instagram and you did a, a fun kind of segment about like Kleenex, like tissue moments oh. and stuff. And then I watched, I watched you're, you're making a face, but I, but anyway, I, I, I read the comments afterwards and everybody was like, I wept like uncontrollably after reading the yeah. Nightingale and I, I was hysterical after four wins. And I was like, wow, Kristen really writes like tear jerkers. Like you definitely, <laughs> why do you think that is? You know, I, I don't ever mean to, honestly. Um, I remember the first time I started hearing that people were crying about my books was 20 years ago. And I called my agent and I said, my career is over. I mean, nobody right. wants to pay $20 to cry. Um, but apparently, Turns out they people do. love it. 
Yeah. <laughs> so and so going into a book, do you know that, or is it is it sort of a natural instinct of yours to write emotionally packed scenes like that? I mean, or is it is it intentional, or is it sort of, sort of a natural? Maybe it's a little bit of both. It's not intentional that it's a tearjerker, but it is intentional in the sense that I believe in fiction and in life that character is revealed by adversity and it's honed by hardship. And, you know, this, this journey of what I tend to write about, you know, a woman's journey to become her authentic self and to find her voice to get there. She generally has to go through some really hard times and she has to learn how to stand up for herself and speak for herself and, and, and survive um, hardship. So my women tend to go through, you know, the Vietnam war, the great depression, the, the occupation of France, some really times that would test anyone. And, um, and I think in reading about that, and identifying with the women who have survived that, I think we learn something about our history and learn something about ourselves. And one of the things we learn most is sort of the, the commonality of humanity, how, how we all feel when we're trying to save our children's lives or you know dealing with the death of a parent or whatever it is. Right. All right, I'm gonna ask you a, com a com question that's completely somewhat off topic, but also something I've been thinking about a lot, and that is generative AI. Uh, I know. I, um, I'm i just wondering, for somebody like you, I would imagine that generative AI, I bet you could type in, and I didn't try this before, you know, write this in the style of Kristen Hanna, and it would probably come up in your style, um, or somewhat in your style. And some writers have even commented like, wow, that sounds actually like something I would write, you know. <laughs> you, have you played around? Do you use it as a tool no. at all in your writing? No stay away from it. I am like, whatever is possible here with regard to the creation of the arts, I am not interested in. I mean, I know it's out there. I know people are scared of it. I know that my books are being used to treat, to, to teach. Train it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. To train it. So, you know, it's not like I think, Hey, I'm so talented and so unique that I can't be replicated. I'm I'm sure that I can be. I just have to believe um, that that what's in my head, the thing that can't be copied, um, stays there and stays relevant and continues to be something that uh, gives me something to say. Yep. Amen to that. Um, I noticed or I read that Warner Brothers has optioned the book. Congratulations on Thank that. You. Thank you. Does, does that always, does has that been happening in the last few books or how many of your books have been mm -hmm. on? Like with the Nightingale option, I would imagine. Oh, the Nightingale actually was about a week from filming when oh. in lockdown, uh, March of 20. No. So I actually think the Nightingale is going to, going to perk up and do a little something this year, hopefully Great. get filmed or cast or something. Such a, um, such a and cinematic book, that one. Thank yeah. you. There, yeah, there's others have been optioned, and then they made uh, a Netflix, you know, series yeah. out of one of them last year. So it's it's out and about there. It's a very different world, uh, Hollywood and films, and and uh, I try to stay on my side of that divide. Do they ask? Them... You, yeah, do they ask you to to be involved? I mean, do you do you have some consultation on the scripts when they come out or do they, it, does it, or does it depend on the project? Yeah, it really depends on, on who, I mean, I like to have some kind of input because I tend to think, um, you know, that I, that I do story fairly well. And I like to be able to weigh in on changes, not because they've changed the book, but because, you know, just cause I like to give an opinion on whether I think it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and some are, you know, receptive to that. Some aren't. Um, so it becomes its own thing. Yeah. Who do you, so who do you read when you're not working and, and you probably not always want to read people that are in the same sort of genre as you were, maybe, maybe you do, but I'm curious, like, who do you enjoy reading? Do you enjoy fiction more than nonfiction? Tell me a little. I like, do. Yeah. I, you know, I read so much nonfiction in my research phase um, that I tend to read fiction and I tend 
like if I'm on vacation, I am going to read probably a thriller mm -hmm. or horror or, you know, something um, that's completely different from what I do. Yeah. But my very favorite kinds of books are, you know, big emotional epics that teach me about a time or a place or uh, a point in history, something like, uh, sounds like shadow of, of the wind. Yeah. Shadow of, I, know, I was like, that sounds like your books, but, uh, yeah, yeah. but shadow of the wind is one that you, that you love. Yeah. Shadow of the wind, uh, the Prince of Tides, um, Pat Conroy. I loved, um, Anne Rice's like the witching hour and, uh, the vampire books. So I have a pretty broad range of books that I like. Yeah. Have you read Lonesome Dove? Oh, there's another one. That's one of my That's favorites. Perfect. Yeah. It's like a yeah. book. Um, all right. This has been amazing. Uh, Kristen, the book is called The Women. It is out, I believe, in February. It is It is out. It will be available in February. You can pre-order it now. Kristen, thank you so much for coming back on my show. 